We're going to be in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. As you're finding your place there, every four years we have an opportunity for a transition of power here in our land, the highest office in our land. Depending on how people vote, that transition of power can happen in eight years. Now, voting has not always been the mode by which a transition of power happens. Uh, throughout, throughout history, people have grabbed power through a coup or through uh, wars, uh, sometimes through royal succession or conquest, uh, and sometimes by peaceful means. And we know at least of someone who had the audacity one time to uh, try to stage a coup against God and take over the kingdom of God by force. We know him as Lucifer in the Bible. Uh, we also know him as our adversary, Satan, or adversary, Satan. And the Bible says that he wanted to raise his throne above the stars of God to make him like the most high. He wanted to be like God. In his failed attempt to try to be like God, to raise his throne above the stars of God, God gave him permission to have a temporary dominion, a temporary kingdom. In fact, that is the kingdom from which we have been rescued, the Bible says. If you're a believer in Christ, you have been rescued um, from the domain of darkness. And this is the kingdom that will ultimately be overthrown completely. And we look forward to that day. In fact, today we want to talk about that most important moment in time when there will be a transition of power and Christ will reclaim completely what has been delegated temporarily uh, to Satan. It will not happen by vote. Uh, it will not happen by peaceful means either. The Bible says it will happen without the aid of any human hand. And we'll look at that in a moment. And the world will witness this in, in the day that's, that Jesus dethrones Satan. He will say this to you and me. According to Matthew 25, verse 34. Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this has been God's plan even before creation for him to one, time, one day reclaim completely or take full control of the affairs of the world, the kingdom of the world. Now, the, um, we long for a kingdom, and that is true of our heart, even though we enjoy the benefits of being a part of a democratic republic, I guess, for now. But the ideal form of government is an everlasting theocracy. The Bible says that very clearly, under the rule of Christ, because it's a benevolent rule, a benevolent rule. And on that day, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, will reign supreme from Jerusalem, and with all justice and peace, the Bible gives us several examples of that. For example, Isaiah 9, verse 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told that the angel told uh, Mary, He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, referring to Jesus Christ, and his kingdom will have no end. And the psalmist reminds us that his kingdom it is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. That's in Psalm 145, verse 13. And today, as we look to that day in the future from the book of Revelation, our hearts rejoice over that transition of power which will take place. We've been longing for that uh, since we have become believers in Christ. So follow along with me in Revelation 11, verse 15, as the seventh trumpet sounds. Uh, let's see what happens here. This is a shorter passage than we read last week. And it says this, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones, uh, who sit on the thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was open. 
And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And so we conclude here with this abbreviated version of the seventh uh, trumpet here, the seventh trumpet judgments. We're going to see seven more judgments called the bowl judgments. In fact, that is why verse 14 of uh, Revel Revelation 11, John says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly, because there are coming more judgments. And the more amplified version of that event, we read about that in the next few chapters. But this is now an abbreviated version of how that's going to happen. In fact, before we dig deep into the text here, I want, I want you to know three disclaimers here. You might want to write them down. The first one is we do not need to confuse this trumpet here with the one that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, the last trumpet. They're not the same because the last trumpet that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 prompts the rapture of the church. It happens in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment's notice. This one here, as we notice, uh, starts a process, namely the seven bold judgments or the seven vile judgments, which we will learn about in a few more chapters. So they're not the same trumpet, so don't confuse the two. Um, the second uh, disclaimer is, uh, like I said earlier, this is an abbreviated version of the second coming of Christ. There are a lot more details for, for us to learn when we get to the chapter 19 when it talks about how Jesus Christ is going to come and reign on the earth. But the third disclaimer is this. Remember, we've been talking about uh, divine paradoxes here in the book of Revelation, divinely inspired paradoxes. For example, a few weeks ago, we talked about John concealing information uh, by the mandate of God. He is concealing information, writing a book that promises to reveal information. That's a divinely inspired and fascinating paradox. Now this one here, in this short passage that we read, there are four more of those divinely inspired paradoxes I want you to know. For example, we have wrath and worship in the same scene. We have joy and judgment in the same vision. We have also reward and reprobation, delight and destruction. That is by divine design. That is meant to catch our attention so that we can stop and meditate on these things and wonder why they are so. And we ask God to illuminate our minds so we can understand divine revelation. So with that in mind, let's um, keep in mind here that the main focus of this scene, the main focus of this whole thing that we just read here is that the establishment of God's kingdom should be the greatest longing of our heart. The establishment of the kingdom of God should be the greatest longing of our heart. How do we know that? Because Jesus, teaching his disciples how to pray, said this. When you pray, you pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. So he instructs his disciples to long for the establishment of the kingdom of God. And when we pray to God, we pray, Lord, your kingdom come. And we're going to look at how this happens here. And we're given a sneak peek of that day. Again, an abbreviated version now, but later on with more details. And we will get to that portion in the book of Revelation of, in a few more chapters. But for now, I want you to see that in verse 14, what we have in this sneak peek of that great day is a transition of leadership. A transition of leadership. The sounding of the seventh trumpet here prompts another recital of praise. Did you notice that? There were several of them in chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. Heaven is a loud place. Don't let anybody tell you that heaven is a quiet and boring place. That is just not the case according to the book of Revelation. We have uh, read about some of them earlier. And um, as soon as John was taken up to heaven to see those things, and now we're, we're given them another we're, we're given another chance to see one more of those. Although John does not specify who are the ones uh, uttering those words, we can conclude that by the context. For example, remember the tribulation martyrs in, verse, uh, in chapter 6 associated with seal number 5? They're seen in heaven praying for vengeance to God. They're saying, Lord, how long will it be until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then they're promised to wait a little more because there are more folks coming to join this group. So you just wait because there are more people waiting to join this group. And then we see them in chapter 7. 
uh, what we call them tribulation saints, more people who will be killed and martyred during that time, they join the community of the redeemed in heaven, the, the, martyr, the, 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 the tribulation martyrs, and they're singing a song of praise. And now in chapter uh, 11, verse 15, we see some voices here that say the kingdom of the Lord of, of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Well, they have to be the people who were longing for the kingdom of God to be established, the people who prayed before for the Lord to avenge their blood. We know that because uh, in verse 7 of chapter 10, we're told that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished. The mystery of God is finished, meaning all of the revelation pointing to the kingdom of God will be finally come true, will, will finally come to pass. So these folks are waiting for that moment, and no doubt they're joined by the thousands and thousands of angels. There's no reason why we wouldn't think that's the case, but they have been waiting for the second coming of Christ. But they utter an interesting expression here when they say the kingdom of the world. Some of your Bible translations may have the kingdoms of the world. That is an expression meant to designate the domain of darkness. The, 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 the kingdom which has been entrusted temporarily to Satan. Now you will remember that when Jesus was tempted in Matthew number four, chapter 4, he offered the kingdoms of this world to Jesus Christ on the condition of uh, being worshipped. He said, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory will be given to you if you just worship me. And even though Satan is the father of all lies, the Bible says this was a true statement because he was given temporary and restricted control of this world. How do we know that? For example, um, Paul says in Ephesians 2.2 2, that the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, he's identifying Satan. Also, we're told that uh, Satan is the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He, he's the god of the world who has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they may not see the light of the gospel. So he's been very active uh, running his kingdom today. And also John, the guy who wrote the book of Revelation here, tells us in 1 John 5 that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, which means that he was given dominion when church in Genesis 3, when uh, the man, Adam, sinned and th therefore um, and brought the sin to the world and forfeited his temporary dominion of the kingdoms of the world. So now Satan has influence over the leaderships, the, the, the governments and the kingdoms and the empires of the world. Well, we are comforted to know that this is only a temporary thing. It's a restricted administration. And there was uh, one day he is going to be dethroned. And by the way, we know he has a throne because John tells in the second chapter of the book of Revelation to the church in Pergamon, Pergamum that Jesus Christ told him to write, I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is. So Satan has a throne. It's an inferior throne to the throne of God, of course, and as a temporary throne. Now, who do you think, church, was behind Pharaoh's persecution of Israel? And who do you think was behind the government-sponsored persecution of the early church? And who do you think is now behind the government-sponsored persecution of the church in places like North Korea or China or the Middle East? I'll give you a hint. Again, when John wrote to the churches in Asia Minor uh, under commission from Jesus Christ, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and some of them were being persecuted to the point of almost despairing. Now, Satan influences the world leaders. We know that. He has done that for thousands of years. He has been very effective in doing that. Why? Because the Bible says he deceives the nation. He not only blinds the eyes of unbelievers, he deceives the nation. He persecutes you and me because we are the object of God's love. Therefore, we are the object of Satan's hatred. Because we are redeemable, he is not. Because Jesus Christ became human. And he, uh, he promised, uh, God promised to crush the head of the serpent by a human, namely the God-man, Jesus Christ. So we know that every emperor, every king, every president, every governor that ever existed was and is in place because God put them there. But here's a promise for us, something important for us to remember here. Paul says that there is no authority except from God. 
In Romans 13, he says this, There is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So we know that God is in complete control. Nothing escapes the control of God. We long for the time that the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior because that's going to be a benevolent king, a benevolent kingdom. But we are Americans. We don't like kings. We like presidents. We like to be in charge of decisions. We like to vote. And that's a wonderful thing to do. And we need to be good stewards of that privilege to vote. But when we get to the everlasting theocracy under Jesus Christ, there will be no need for that. Why? Because it's going to be an everlasting kingdom of righteousness. And he's going to rule with righteousness. But we know that in the meantime, the governments of the world, the kingdoms of the world, are ordained by God. Therefore, we should always remember that as Christians, we are not called to rebel against the government. Did you know that? We are not called to rebel against the government. We're called to obedience. Now, there is a time for civil disobedience, a time to do that orderly and respectfully, and that is in the Bible. And when uh, that's in Acts chapter 4, when the government tells us we are not supposed to mention the name of Christ anymore, that is the time to say we will respectfully disobey. Or when the government ever tells us you cannot preach the Bible, that is the time where we say we will dis uh, respectfully disobey and we will continue to do that. We have the examples of uh, two of the disciples that did that in Acts 4. But in the meantime, we're told to submit for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Peter says this in 1 Peter 2 verses 13 through 15. He says, submit to any uh, human institution, whether to a king or to one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do right. Listen to this, church, for this is the will of God. This is the will of God. So, you know, but Pastor, I'm not sure what the will of God is for my life. Well, here it is. Submit to the governing authorities because by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of such foolish men. He's saying here, in Remember, Peter is writing to believers under the persecution of the Roman emperor Nero. And yet he says, fear God, honor the king. So we're not called, church, to overthrow the government. We're not called to organize an uprising and rebellion. We're called to live in peace and submit to the governing authorities, knowing that they, this all belongs to God. He has the final say in everything. The governing authorities are there because God put them there. And we pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Lord, your kingdom come. But in the meantime, we pay our taxes. On time, by the way, in a few more weeks. I'm sorry for reminding you this. But if you haven't done them yet, this is the time. Jesus modeled that for us. When he said, for example, in Matthew 22, 21, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And the reason he said that is because every human government is only temporary. We are citizens of heaven, the Bible says. If, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, your citizenship is in heaven. We love our American citizenship and we cherish that as a gift from God, but our true citizenship is not here because God's kingdom is not of this world, he says. And one day the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord, meaning he will come and take his rightful place as the king of kings and lord of lords. And on that day, Satan will have to surrender his throne to God because Satan is the usurper, and he will have to surrender. And God will tell him, time's up, buddy. It's my time now to take over. And there will be a transfer or a transition in leadership here. Notice that the loud voices in, the, in this recital of praise here, uh, they, they, they're, they're reciting a recital of thanksgiving. There's gratitude here when they said, uh, we give thanks, O Lord, the Almighty. Uh, those are the 20, we know who they are. They're the 24 elders. Um, and th th at that time, they are joining in the, uh, the tribulation saints because their prayer has been answered. They have been vindicated. There will be no more corruption, no more persecution. And according to Daniel 9, 24, this is the, the kingdom of God will be an everlasting kingdom of righteousness. And what an encouragement for the churches who are reading this, the seven churches in Asia Minor. Keep that in mind. They are the original readers of the book of Revelation, and they are under persecution. They are 
fearing for their lives. Some of them were flirting with sin. Some of them are dealing with uh, persecution by just compromising. Uh, there's one church here that com committed complete apostasy. There's the dead church and all of that. What an encouragement for them to know that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. And what an encouragement for them to, to see here the celebration that's taking place in heaven because this is a time yet future. We rejoice with them because uh, the longing of their heart is the longing of our heart too. And we look forward to the kingdom of God, not Uncle Sam, to provide for our needs. Is that clear, church? We look for the kingdom of God. We look for God to meet every one of our needs, not Uncle Sam. Now, God may use uh, the human government here for a period of time to provide for us. And we, we appreciate the freedom that we have. We appreciate the protection from enemies that we have here. But we need, to look, we need to look forward to the perfect form of government that is coming. And that perfect form of government is the kingdom of God, which has been promised in the Old Testament, and which Christ will say, Come, you beloved of my Father, because there's a kingdom that has been prepared for you before even the foundation of the world. And that day is, only, is known only to God when that's going to take place. We, we're reading about the future here. So besides the transition of leadership here that we talked about. The sounding of the seventh trumpet also brings about a transfer of ownership. A transfer of ownership. And I want you to know that the, own, the transfer of ownership is not from Satan to Jesus Christ. Satan never had ownership of anything. The transfer of ownership is from God the Father to God the Son. How do we know that? Because chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, we see here that Jesus Christ, symbolized by the Lamb, takes the title deed of the universe from the hand of the Father, meaning the Father is giving everything to the Son because He's the heir. He's the rightful heir. So He has the scroll in His hands. Jesus does. The scroll sealed seven times, which represents the title deed of the universe or the writ of possession. And the idea here is that Jesus Christ is going to come and say, I'm here to repossess the property. I'm here to take what is rightfully mine. Satan is the usurper. Satan is the bad tenant. Jesus Christ is the owner. So there will be a transfer of ownership that will finally take place practically. And they're talking about here that that day is coming. In fact, they use the past tense. Did you notice that in verse 17, the 24 elders? We give thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Even though this is in the future for us, we're seeing this vision here, this scene, as if it had already happened. Because of the certainty of it. Because this is biblical truth. This is how it's going to happen. It's so certain that it's going to happen that they uh, say this in, in the past tense. And by the way, when uh, they are uttering these words, there's an, uh, an important detail here for us to, to see. They refer to God as the Almighty, the attribute of omnipotence. But they use the expression who are and who were. Did you notice anything that's missing here? Who is to come? Notice in Revelation 1, verse 4, Jesus introduces himself as he who was, who is, and who is to come. And then same thing again in verse 8 of that first chapter. And then in Revelation 4, verse 8, we're told that he is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. But now what we see here, uh, the, the 24 elders are saying, him who is, uh, you who are, and who were. Why are they omitting the who is to come? Because it's already taken place by this time. In other words, he who is to come has now come. And he will be forevermore. And they're speaking of the second coming of Christ as an, a reality already. Something that has already taken place by this time. And again, there are more, a lot more details of this event here that we're going to read about in the next few chapters. Remember, chapter 12 starts a digression. Keep that in mind. You will get lost in the book of Revelation if you don't understand this. Chapter 12 of Revelation, the storyline takes a U-turn and goes back in time in the future. So in, the, in a sense, the, world, the, the scene that we're seeing here goes back to the future. Okay, so the storyline here takes a U-turn and goes back and tells us uh, the story of the tribulation from the perspective of Satan with a little bit more details with 144,000, all of those characters that we have met briefly so far. And the tremendous lessons that we get from these things. Now, every transfer of power that we know of today happens through human agency. I mentioned in the beginning, in the beginning, either through elections 
uh, through a coup or through uh, a royal descendancy. But this transition of power is going to happen without any human agency. We know that because the book of Daniel gives us a beautiful picture of how that's going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, had a dream in a vision, and he was troubled by what he saw. In fact, he killed some folks who weren't able to determine what it was that he was seeing. And only Daniel came and was able to explain to the king not only the dream, but what the dream meant. And what he saw was a statue, okay? The head of that statue was made of gold. The breast and the arms were made of silver. The thighs were made of bronze and the legs of iron and the feet a mixture of clay and iron. That's in the second chapter of the book of Daniel. If you want to write those references down and later on read that. Uh, and each one of those body parts in that statue, the book tells us that. They represent a different empire, a different kingdom uh, of antiquity. For example, the head was Babylon, uh, the breast and the arms were Medo-Persia, then the thighs were Greece, the legs were Rome, and the feet were the revived Roman Empire of the future. We're going to learn about that in a few more chapters. And what we're told here is that Daniel says... And he writes down in his book, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all of these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And the image that, uh, that the king was seeing was that a, a, a stone was cut without human hands and crushed the statue. And that represented that the kingdom of God has now become the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdoms of the world have now become the kingdom of God without the assistance of anybody. So, in the recital here, the elders continue to sing and they teach us very important lessons here in, in their words in heaven here. The first one is God's plan to reward. God's plan to reward in verse 16 all the way through verse 18. And the other one is God's... Uh, plan to judge or God's power to destroy. But for now, let's look at God's plan to reward. There's a sequence of events here in case uh, you've missed it. When he says, uh, you who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign, and the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to be to reward. So there's that little word that separates the sequence of events here that they are describing. So here is a sequence of events. First of all, Jesus will return to earth and will establish the millennial kingdom. And they're speaking of this in the past uh, tense here as if it had already happened. We've already determined that. But then the return of Christ here will infuriate unbelievers. Why? Because they are God-haters. They hate God. They rebel against Him. And we read about them in chapter 9, the last two verses of that chapter. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. And they went on sinning. They went on committing acts of immorality and so forth. And so, forth. so the people, um, there's a, a great contingency of people here who will not repent. And they will rebel against God. And they are going to be infuriated because they thought... With everything that happened prior to that, with uh, Satan uh, through the Antichrist killing the two witnesses that we met last week, they're going to think, I thought we were done with this. I thought we were victorious over God. But then they're going to be very angry that God is coming to set up his kingdom. They, they're going to be surprised and they're going to be infuriated. And they're they're going to have the foolishness of trying to rise up against God, not knowing that Satan tried that centuries ago and failed miserably. But they're going to be deceived into thinking that maybe they can win. Maybe they can uh, usurp the throne of God again. But the hatred that they have for God will become arrogance and presumption and will culminate everything in the battle of Armageddon. You have heard that name many times before and so many people misunderstand that. There are movies named uh, with that title that have nothing to do with the biblical version of that event, Armageddon. It's in chapter 16. Hold that thought. We'll get to that when we get there. But for now, let's just understand that this is an abbreviated version of all of these things. And the third uh, order of events here described in this very abbreviated version of the second coming of Christ is that there's going to be a time or a season of judgment. How do we know that? Because uh, John, in describing this, used the word for time Kairos in Greek, which means a season rather than a twinkling of an eye, rather than a, a, a dot in time. It's a season of judgment. 
And this is something else we need to understand because the unbelievers of that time, the unregenerate, the unbelieving, dead, will not be condemned until after the thousand years of Christ. So pay close attention here. Again, this is one of those times, again, I need your full attention. Lean forward if you have to, make notes. But check this out. Chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, we're told that the unbelievers are going to be raised up to be condemned. And because of that fact, that this is called the great white throne judgment, because of that fact, it's better for us to understand this season of judgment here as an evaluation of works of the saved people. How do we know that? There's another reference of judgment here, judgment of works, for example, in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. So we need to understand this as God evaluating the works of the people who are dead and now are raised to life in order to be rewarded and go into the millennial kingdom. Did I lose anybody? You still with me here? Okay, because it's easy to get lost here at this time. So it's an evaluation of the works of the tribulation saints that they will be resurrected at that time. How do we know that? Check out Revelation 20, verse 4. Just a few pages over. It says this, John describing what he saw. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. See, they are going to be resurrected right at that moment at the second coming of Christ in order to go into the millennium so that they can reign with Christ for a thousand years. So these are the dead that are having their works judged instead of their, themselves being judged because we know from the Bible that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So they're not going to be sent to condemnation. Their works are going to be evaluated. And what will be their reward? Keep reading here Revelation 20 verses 5 through 6. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. So is that clear, church? The rest of the dead um, did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So church... What's going to be their reward? They're going to be priests, and they're going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. They're going to get into the millennium. They're going to inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for them beforehand, and they're going to go in and uh, reign with Christ. Now, you and I are not going to be a part of this if you're a believer in Christ. We need to make sure we know um, the, chrono the chronology of these events here because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, that our works are going to be evaluated in something called the judgment seat of Christ. Which means that we were gonna, we were, after the rapture of the church, we're going to be presented before Christ in something called the Bema Seed, also known as the Judgment Seed of Christ. Our works are going to be evaluated. They're gonna, uh, and, and we're going to be rewarded according to our works in the body of Christ, according to what we've done uh, after we've been saved, according to our faithfulness to what he's given us to do, how we managed our gifts, how we managed the, uh, if we were not, if we were good stewards, uh, stewards of the things that God has given us. This all happens prior to the second coming of Christ. Now fast forward to the end of the tribulation, the second coming of Christ. We have folks that are being resurrected here and they're being rewarded with going into the kingdom. That's the reward. They're going to be going into the kingdom and they're going to reign with Christ. They're going to be used of God. They're going to be co-regents with Christ and we're going to be a part of that. How do we know that? Because in the recital of praise here, the, the, the elders identify uh, which seems to be different groups of people. Here's what they say. Again, the time has come for you to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great. He could have just grouped them in all in one group and, and, and used one description for the community of the redeemed. But instead of that, they uh, named the, these three different groups. And what that means, church, is Old Testament saints, church saints, you and me, and tribulation saints, all together in one community, one family, the community of the redeemed, getting ready to go into the millennium kingdom of Christ, the kingdom that has been prepared for us from the foundation of the world. That is what that means. But I want you to know that there's an even greater reward for us, for the whole community of the redeemed here. And we see that very clearly in a beautiful picture here in verse 19. Let me, let, let me read it again, see if you catch it. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was open. The temple of God was open. 
Now, specifically, the Holy of Holies was open. You may remember that in the temple of God, the Holy of Holies was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was a restricted place. Only the priests could go in there. But now, John is seeing the temple of God, which is in heaven, and that's open. And the Ark of the Covenant is there. And the message is very clear here. God is saying, you now have unrestricted access to me. Both Jews and Gentiles alike have unrestricted access to the presence of God and that church is our greatest reward the unrestricted presence of God we don't have to fear being in the presence of God anymore that we read in the Bible here the people who are frightened by the holiness of God because of their own sinfulness John was one who experienced that now that's not going to be the case for us anymore because we will have unrestricted full access to God to his presence because the heavenly temple is open and the ark of the covenant if you go back to the Old Testament, you will remember that the Ark of the Covenant represents the very presence of God. And people who dare touch the Ark of the Covenant uh, in a way that is not designed for them to touch, they would die, indicating that this is the holiness of God. We need to take this seriously. But now, John sees the temple open, indicating that we will talk face-to-face -face with God. We have unrestricted access to Him. And that is our great reward and that's God's plan to reward if you're a believer in Christ you will be rewarded twice um, maybe more than that but specifically twice in a, in a sense that you will receive rewards from God at the judgment seat of Christ right after the rapture of the church that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ and the picture of that is Christ sitting in, in, in an elevated platform as the judge of the Olympic Games rewarding uh, the winners. That is the picture right here. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Then um, fast forward to the end of the tribulation. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be a part of that. And then we're going to come down with Him and we're going to be rewarded by going into the millennial kingdom. And we're going to be uh, governors and, and co-regents with Christ in this everlasting theocracy. And we look forward to that because that is a perfect form of government. And that's God's plan to reward. But we also see here in the last few verses God's plan to destroy. You see in verse 18, again, the saints and those um, who fear your name, the time is for God to reward them, the small and the great. But then he finishes the verse to destroy those who destroy the earth. To destroy those who destroy the earth. And please, please do not misunderstand this verse. This is not talking about environmental issues. He is not talking about the fact that he's going to punish people who cut down trees. That is not the case here. He is talking about a spiritual way to destroy the earth. He's referring to unbelievers, people who destroy the earth by spreading sin. Most specifically here, the people of that time, Antichrist's people, people who belong, who have received the mark of the beast, who are destroying the earth by spreading rebellion towards God, by spreading... Uh, uh, not being repentant by spreading sin and by spreading immorality and by spreading idolatry and all of, all of those evils. That's what, the, uh, what, what he means by that. And the, 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 the future is not very bright for these folks because the Bible says they're going to be on the receiving end of the wrath of God. When Christ comes back, he will smite the nations with a sharp sword that's, that, that comes out of his mouth. So instead of receiving the love of God, instead of receiving the Christ uh, that is gracious and receives sinners unto himself, they're going to receive the Christ who wages war. They're going to receive Christ who uh, speaks and they're destroyed. And obviously we understand that this is a figure of speech, the sharp sword that comes out of the mouth of Christ in the book of Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, if you want to write down that, re that reference. Revelation 19, 15 talks about the sharp sword that comes out of the mouth of Christ. God created the world and Christ was involved in creation. We know that from Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. He created the world with words, did he not? He, he spoke and came, uh, things came into being. In the same way, he's going to destroy things with his word, the word that comes out of his mouth. And these poor people are going to be judged because they have not received the love of Christ in Jesus Christ. And we cannot read, again, this verse without agonizing in our hearts for these folks. Because indeed, church, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The book of Hebrews talks about this, chapter 7, 
uh, ch uh, chapter 10, verse 31, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Therefore, therefore, I call on you, if you have not yet, come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. If you have not made business with God by coming to the Father through the Son and acknowledging your sin and your inability to produce your own salvation, today is the day to be renewed, to be transformed, and to be spared future judgment. You can choose to be rewarded, or you can choose to be judged. And it's very clear here in what we have just seen and described through this vision um, of the Apostle John. A transition in leadership and a transfer of ownership at the second coming of Christ. It'll happen soon. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we, the church, if you're a follower of Christ now, if you belong to the community of the church saints, you will be re uh, raptured before that time. So we will not be here to witness these things, but we read them, and this should alarm us enough to go to the people we know and say, come to Jesus Christ. You need to come to him today, not tomorrow. It's not that we don't talk about religion. No, no, no. We talk about your future destiny. It's more important than you think. You need to make a decision today. You need to come to Christ. It's not a suggestion. It's a mandate from God. You need to come to Jesus Christ. It's not optional. Otherwise, my friend, you're going to burn in hell. That's what the Bible says, and that's not a good thing. And you're going to be uh, consumed with the wrath of God. And we are compassionate enough to tell people, you don't want to be a part of that. You come to Jesus Christ and receive His grace and His love and His forgiveness and newness of life. Or you can wait and see if the Bible is true, but you don't want to risk it because we've already known that every promise concerning the first coming of Christ came true, literally. Every promise concerning the second coming of Christ will happen the same way because that is the pattern but you say, Pastor, it's all good and interesting. I, I, I get it. I, this is what the Bible says. I'm worried about the here and now. I'm not worried about the future. I'm the kind of guy who lives in the present. You're telling me about the future. I'm worried about the now. How is this going to affect my life now? Jesus addresses that before you even thought about it. He said this in Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33. Do not worry about uh, what should we eat, what shall we drink, and what shall we wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek those things, but your Heavenly Father already knows that you need them before you ask. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. So church, how do we live today in light of the promise of the coming kingdom of God? We seek the kingdom of God. We seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, knowing that He will provide everything we need. Everything we need. Does that mean I should quit my job and close, close my arms and wait for the kingdom of God? No, because says he, the Bible says he who doesn't work should not eat. That's not what the Bible says. You should provide for your family. But you eagerly wait for the establishment of the kingdom of God. And you seek that and you seek his righteousness and you will be provided everything else you need. And everything that comes from the hand of God, church, is good and you can never outgive God. He is the great giver. So, how we live in the future in light of the coming kingdom of God, we wait eagerly for that day because there's a kingdom that is going to be given to us and that kingdom has been prepared before the foundation of the world. We don't look for Uncle Sam or for the perfect form of government here on earth. We vote. We exercise our rights of American citizens. We do that with a great sense of stewardship because it is a great privilege for us to do that, but we look forward to the everlasting theocracy under the rule of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because he's coming soon. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the word of God and the opportunity we have to learn about uh, future events, Lord. And this is not meant to just satisfy your curiosity. We know that. It's meant to transform our hearts, Lord, and, and to teach us how to live now. It's a very practical book, Lord. We thank you for that. It is indeed a blessing, like you promised in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. It is a blessing to hear these things and to live these things and to practice uh, these things and to walk with you in light of uh, the great future that awaits those who are in Christ Jesus, Lord. But we want to take a moment to pray for those who are not in Christ Jesus that we know, our family members, Lord, people we know in, in our work, people we know in our community who are outside of Christ because of their rebellion. We know that they're doing this because Satan has blinded their eyes, Lord, and it is our great opportunity to 
witness to them and to tell them that Jesus Christ loved them enough to die for them so that they don't have to be judged. They don't have to go through eternity without Christ. So, Father, as we conclude this morning, we pray that you give us a great sense of agony for those who are outside of Christ so that we can go and announce salvation in Jesus, in Jesus Christ so that they can be saved. Lord, for the purpose of them joining the community of the redeemed. We would love for them to join our church, Lord, but they don't have to because you have already determined that. What, what kind of church in the community here in the era they will go, Lord. But it is our job to announce salvation in Jesus Christ by faith trusting that you're going to provide your fruit in due time, Lord. So we want to pray for the people in our circles of influence who don't know Jesus Christ, Lord. And I pray that you give us boldness to announce Jesus Christ to them, Lord. Give every one of us here the courage and the compassion to go and make the phone call, to invite our friend to coffee so that we can share Jesus Christ with him or her, Lord, hoping that you will save another soul, Lord. And we do this because we love you, we want to do this because we want to honor your request here, your commission that you've given us to be disciple makers, to make disciples of every nation, Lord. We love you. We want to honor you. And we want to do everything with excellence, Lord, because you are worthy of our very best. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.